In order to communicate our faith and values, Catholics need to be brave enough to use their own voice, distinct from the mainstream culture. The Catholic Church was, of course, very lucky last century to have a shot in the arm from Poland from its courageous Pope John Paul II, Karol Wojtyla, a man who embodied all the Christian virtues and who stood resolutely against the spirit of the age. He helped bring about the collapse of atheistic communism that had oppressed Eastern Europe, and he stood up for the dignity of the human person. The Catholic Church was a rock under his leadership. His uncompromising integrity inspired young people who instinctively thirsted for moral clarity and a challenge to live up to. And when he was dying, millions of them flocked to Rome, shocking their elders, the jaded baby boomers who thought religion was dead. That conservative pope broke a lot of baby boomer Catholic hearts who had hoped before he arrived that the church was going to modernize to become more user-friendly, tolerant and progressive. In essence, they wanted it to lose its meaning and become a hollow reflection of their own lives. Many of the ills of the church in recent times could be attributed to that struggle, and the resurgence of the church today can be attributed initially to the influence of the blessed John Paul II. A couple of months ago, a newly renovated Catholic church was opened in London, Soho. It was a glittering occasion, described in a wonderful article in London's Daily Telegraph, which was sent to me by a friend. St. Patrick's Church in Soho Square is where all the strands of Catholic renewal weave together, wrote the newspaper's leader writer, Damien Thompson. The freestanding altar in the round has been moved back to the front of the church so that mass can be celebrated facing east or west. There is a mission to the homeless, housed in the new building with alcohol and drug counselling for Soho's addicts and prostitutes. There is the Eucharistic adoration that John Paul II put at the heart of his pontificate. And there is a school of ev evangelisation started by the parish priest, which is part of what John Paul II called his new evangelisation, which he said no believer or institution of the church is exempt from, to proclaim Christ to all people. This beautifully restored church is symbolic of the renewal of the Catholic Church. And George Weigel, who I mentioned earlier, the Catholic theologian, spoke at St. Patrick's that night about Pope Benedict and the future of the West. He spoke of renewal and the new evangelization. Like all births or renewals, this is not something that occurs without effort or pain. It requires what Weigel calls bold leaders who call the timid to the fullness of conversion. It requires disciples and leaders who are unfailingly pro-life and who are capable of rebutting the spurious charge that to be pro-life is to be anti-woman. It requires disciples and leaders who are pro-family and pro-marriage. It requires disciples and leaders prepared to speak truth to power, especially when coercive state power is deployed to impose the agenda of the dictatorship of relativism. We will hear more from George Weigel later this year when he comes to Sydney to talk at Campion College. But to find bold leaders standing against the tide <coughs> requires people who are made of the right stuff, who are grounded in what in less politically correct times were called the manly virtues. Whatever you call them, we know what they are. C.S. Lewis called them cardinal virtues, using cardinal in the sense of pivotal not in the sense of Cardinal Pell. <laughs> These virtues are prudence, which is practical common sense and good judgment, it's discreet and circumspect. Temperance doesn't have to mean not drinking or indulging in any pleasures, but to be moderate in all things, not to overindulge. Justice, of course, means being fair and honest and keeping promises. And fortitude is courage and strength in adversity. But you can't leave out humility, which is the vanquished virtue of our age. The one most lacking and the one most necessary for balance. Pride, self-confidence and an exaggerated sense of self-importance are the qualities most prized in our narcissistic times. They are the hallmarks of winners, while humility is seen as a weakness. Humility is really the ability to have an accurate opinion of yourself 
to see your own inadequacy with clear eyes. The ancient Greeks knew it to be an essential quality of heroes, a product of courage and self-knowledge. Humility is the antidote to pride, which C.S. Lewis damned as the greatest sin of all, the vice that leads to every other vice. The stern virtues are now laughably anachronistic, but they used to be understood as the building blocks on which a child's character was formed. They are a sort of ground zero in a person's makeup. They used to be part of the fabric of our society. Every child drank them in with breast milk. Through our fables, the stories we tell, our art, poetry, music, literature, we communicated what it took to be a person of good character. And children prized those traits and dreamed of being heroes. Andrew Mullins, the former headmaster of Sydney's Redfield College, wrote a book once to encourage parents in the lost arts of moulding their children's characters by teaching good habits. He too laid out the cardinal virtues necessary for children's future happiness, calling them wisdom, self-control, justice and courage. These are habits of mind which need to be a lifelong habit, which become hardwired into our psyches so we are equipped to do battle resolute and armour-plated. When you see our public figures failing and politicians being caught in sex scandals and corruption charges, movie stars caught out with love children and multiple mistresses, the public feels genuinely betrayed. Newspapers and the rest of the media feed off these scandals and are accused of fueling them, but they cover them because of the public interest. The fact is that people still hunger for virtue even if they are not taught how to achieve it. Thank you.